This is the famous DeLong Ruby. It was stolen in the most daring jewel robbery of recent times. One of these three men was a key figure in its recovery. What is your name, please? My name is William Federici. My name is William Federici. My name is William Federici. Only one of these gentlemen is the real William Federici. The other two are imposters and will try to fool this panel. Tom Poston, Peggy Cass, Orson Bean, and Kitty Carlisle on to tell the... And here's your host, Bud Collier. Thank you very much. Welcome once again to, to Tell the Truth. Thank you. Good evening, panel. Good evening, Good evening panel. All set and ready to go, are you? Yes. yes. Okay, open up your envelope and follow along with me on this first story, if you will, which is a very interesting one. I, William Federici, am a crime reporter for the New York Daily News. For nearly a year, I have been covering one of the most daring jewel robberies of modern times, the theft of over $400,000 worth of gems from New York's Museum of Natural History. The most valuable jewels, the Star of India and the Midnight Star Sapphire, were both recovered earlier this year. The whereabouts of the DeLong Ruby, however, remained a mystery. Recently, I was contacted by an intermediary who guaranteed the return of the Ruby for a ransom price of $25,000. John D. MacArthur, a Florida millionaire, agreed to put up the money. We then received instructions to proceed to a specific public phone booth near Palm Beach and wait for the phone to ring. When the call came through, we were told to feel around near the ceiling in the phone booth. There, nestled in the dust on a ledge over the door, was the 100 carat de long ruby. Signed, William Federici. gentlemen all claim to be William Federici. As you heard, we start the questioning with our own Star Sapphire, Kitty Carlisle. Thank you, Bud. Uh, it's a terribly exciting story. I don't know where to begin. Uh, number three, are you free to say who the intermediary was? Yes, I believe so. Uh, Mr. Antell. Uh, number two, who is Mr. Antell? Mr. Antell is a sometime freelance writer. Uh, number one, how did MacArthur get interested in this? He was asked to by Mr. Antell. Uh, number three, what, when you felt around on the ledge in the phone booth, was the ruby in a box or was it all by itself? No, it was in a little bag. It was in a bag. Number two, when you took it to the jeweler to have it uh, evaluated, uh, what did he tell you? Uh, he said, that's it. Huh. <laughs> How did he know? He was waiting for us. Oh, he was waiting for us. Took it. one look. alerted. How many carrots did it weigh, number one? Oh. 100.3 carats. Number three, when you went to the phone booth, this wasn't the first stop on your trail to find the jewel. It, you, you'd been to other places before. Can you tell me where? Well, this is the first place we've been directed to. Didn't you have to make other stops en route? Tom Poston, do you make other stops en route? Well, I don't know. Number two, who is the, who is the we uh, that says when we were contacted and we were told to look above the shelf and so forth? Who, which we is that, number two? Uh, that was the other man with me. Who was he? MacArthur. Oh, oh I see. Uh, the man, number one, the man who put up the money was went along with you to, uh, to, to find this, uh, get this back? Yes, it was his money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. number, number one, again, that looks like a sapphire in the picture. Do rubies have that star uh, quality about them? I believe they do, yes. I mean, number three, that is the picture of the ruby. I'm afraid I can't see it from here, sir. No, I mean, it was shown to us at the beginning. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's the ruby, and it has that, that star, star quality about it? Absolutely. Number three, uh, when, when the other jewels were recovered, what was the, uh, how did the recovery take place? Where were they located? Where they were, were located they? in a uh, box at a bus station. Uh, what condition? Thank you. Peggy Cat. Thank you. Um, number three, when those guys had that ruby, did they give it to a fence? I mean, did, did you get it from a, did a fence put it in the telephone booth? I'm afraid there are certain things I can't say. Oh. Um, well, I'll take it. Uh, we don't know, fence. very frankly. It, it was there. We got a phone call. Well, so, number two, I heard that this was in uh, sort of a, a, a collateral for a loan. Well, who'd give you a loan on a $125 hot ruby? I don't understand it. I mean, I really didn't understand the story when I read it in the paper. No offense. <laughs> 
Uh, I mean, how could you borrow money on a hot ruby? Would you, you repeat that question, please? Yes, I know what I mean. You know what I mean. Well, that's why you're on the panel. You can borrow money on it. Oh, you can? Uh, number one, is that MacArthur one of the ten richest men in the world? I believe he is, yes. I've read that in a magazine. Yeah, I read that in a magazine, too, about him. Hmm. I uh, want to introduce me. Uh, that, now. Orson <laughs> <laughs> B. Number three. Uh, I believe I read that the ruby was displayed somewhere immediately after being found. Is that true? It was displayed in a local bank. I believe that uh, Mr. MacArthur was one of the principals of the bank. He was a depositor there. Yeah, uh, number two, does uh, Mr. MacArthur have a famous relative in law? Do you know? Uh, yes, he does, Helen Hayes. All right. Number one, uh, who, going back a ways, who jumped out of a motel window? I don't want to get personal, but uh, there was something in the Daily News I remember about that. Well, I believe it was supposed to have been uh, several detectives and one of the prisoners. I don't remember. All yeah. right. Number three, who, what's Murph the Surf's first name? <laughs> Jack. Uh, number three, do you think he's going to be a movie star when he gets out of the, the plane? <laughs> if television doesn't get him first. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Without any consultation, please mark your ballots now, and uh, no changing once you have marked. Select, however, if you will, and be free to, number one, number two, or number three. Our team of challengers will receive $250 for every incorrect vote. Are all ballots marked? Yes, they are. Very well. Tom, for whom did you vote? I voted for number one, bud. I would have trusted any of them with my, with my jewels. I thought they looked like forthright, uh, intrepid reporters, members of the fourth estate. But I think number one had a serious attitude about the recovery, so I voted for him. Peggy Cat. Well, I think they were all swell, but three acted mad when I said I didn't understand the story, so I guess he must have written it. <laughs> Orson B. Well, I think they're, they're all great. Number three has a real sense of humor, which you probably need to write for the Daily News. But I, I, I think that... Uh, <laughs> Is, uh, he looks, uh, he is uh, furtive of eye and uh, he has the look of the gumshoe about him. Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number three. I thought he gave the best answers and seemed most serious about the whole problem. And if uh, he worked on it for a year, he must be pretty serious about it. Very well, the votes are in and the minds are made up, as you can well see and have heard. Now let's find out which one of these three gentlemen, in truth, is William Federici. Will the real William Federici, please. Stand up. Oh, it's ah. <laughs> oh, boy. And certainly, I would just like to add that uh, Bill Federici has been a crime reporter for the New York Daily News for 14 years, and during that time has won nine awards for excellence in reporting. Would you tell us your real name and what you really do, sir? Carl Parker. I'm vice president of Melrose Realty Company. Thank you, sir. And number three, what is your real name and what do you do? My name is Ara Daglian. I'm the manager of the Cornell University Club of New York. Well, we checked the score to find that there were two incorrect votes, and that's twice $250 for a total of $500, gentlemen. Hope that keeps a smile on your face as you brought to ours tonight. Thanks for that very interesting story. Continued success to you. Good night and God bless you. Let's meet our next team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Judy Perry. My name is Judy Perry. My name is Judy Perry. You now have copies of this story in front of you. If you will, panel, follow along with it. I, Judy Perry, and my co-author, Jinx Cragen, have just written a new book, especially designed to help the poor working girl and snare the perfect husband. We call it Saucepans and the Single Girl, operating on the principle that suitors, like armies, move faster and farther on full stomachs. We have compiled an arsenal of recipes designed to capture almost every known species of confirmed bachelor, including such basic male types as the amorous athlete, the lover with a lyca, the man in the gray flannel suit, the man in the garret, and, of course, faithful old Charlie. 
both Jinx and I are now happily married to young men who came to eat our cooking and stayed to propose. Signed, Judy Perry. <laughs> Three young ladies all claim to be Judy Perry. You heard that, and so did I. Let's start the cross-examination with Orson Bean. Orson? Thank you, bud. Uh, Judy uh, Perry, number three, you and Jinx Cregan, <laughs> which is a great name, have written a book called Saucepans and the Single Girl. Do you honestly believe that it is still possible to win a man through his stomach? Hmm. I think it helps. Well, number two, in this day and age when you can buy frozen saucer scoffier, <laughs> does anybody really care that, that a girl can still go in and make something from scratch? Well, actually, our book uh, is not a from-scratch book. Oh. It does use some of these little frozen goodies. Oh, number one, do you agree with that? <laughs> oh, definitely. Well, I must say I agree with you because some great stuff is prepared nowadays. Oh, definitely. What are some of the great things that you can buy all prepared? Oh, or, you frozen might, uh, bread dough and escoffier yeah. sauce, as you mentioned, yeah. hollandaise sauce. Kitty Carlisle. Well, I agree that you can still get a man through his stomach. I think it's the most wonderful idea I've ever heard of. All right. I can't cook. But... <laughs> Tell me something very important, number two. Uh, what happens if you mix your fellows up and you feed amorous athletes the meal for faithful Charlie? What happens? Probably nothing. They're not aware that we have such a strategy behind it anyway. <laughs> well, number, number one, what would you give amorous athletes, for instance? Would oh, you I... try to calm him down, or would you? <laughs> <laughs> this depends. Uh, you give him a... <laughs> Keep him running. I'd wear some down. <laughs> give him a, a very glamorous stew and a, some kind of a fruit dessert, and he's happy. He thinks he's still in training. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Poston. Thank you. Well, the, the girls are so pretty. I'm surprised that they would have any difficulty at all snaring a man for... Number three, uh, you, you're, do you try any of these recipes yourself? You're so slender. And... Oh, sure, all of them. Yeah, and it doesn't... Uh, are they all calorie-counting uh, kind of diets and things? Well, they're all rather fattening foods, really, but we don't eat this seven days a week. We only have this for the occasion when the man comes by. I see, I see. <laughs> Uh, number two, now that you're married, do you still keep feeding amorous athletes as well as cheerful Charlie? Or? Well, my husband is not an amorous athlete, so I try to <laughs> keep it within his limitations and mine. <laughs> no, number one, when you... Oh, oh. Thank you, Cat. Number two, uh, which one of these guys did you marry? Did you marry the lover with the Leica? Uh, no, more the Brooks brother man, I imagine. Thank you. Number three, what is your, your idea of a favorite meal of any man? You know, the average favorite meal. I think most men think they like steak, but they prefer something like drunk chicken, you know, sort of flaming. <laughs> they do not. They like steak. I agree. <laughs> uh, uh, number one, you said it's good to buy frozen hollandaise sauce. It's very easy to make hollandaise sauce, don't you know that? Oh, but it's easier to open the jar. But it's not as good. Oh, I know. Well, not number three, did any of these guys ever take you out for a meal, or were you just over the hot stove all the time? <laughs> Yes, we had a gourmet lover who did take us out to dinner, and we were scared to death when we finally had to cook one for him. That's it. Time for you to mark your ballots. Mark them at once. Don't worry. No consultation, please. No consultation, please. Just mark your ballots. Without change, voting for number one, number two, or number three. All ballots seem to be marked. Very well, Tom, for whom did you vote? Well, I, I voted for number two. I, I, as I said when I was questioning, and they're so pretty, I, any one of them could get me to eat anything. But I thought that number two had a kind of a hearty uh, approach to the idea, and I think that's what's going to be needed to get these guys to sit down and eat and then propose. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy Cass. Well, I voted for number one. I thought she was funny and sassy and cute. Any guy I'd marry if she couldn't cook at all. <laughs> Worse than me. Well, I remember the terrible explosion over at the Merritt Farm when they fed lay or bust chicken food to one of the roosters. So I know how terrible it can be to, uh, <laughs> to feed the wrong person the wrong thing. I voted for number three because of... <laughs> Oh, dear heaven. Kitty Carlisle. 
I voted for number three because although they are all indeed terribly pretty, I believe that this works. And you have to be rather thoughtful to sit down and write a book about it. And I'm sure it works, and so I voted for number three. Well, that splits up in an interesting way. Let's see how it works out in truth, shall we? As the votes are all in and the mind's made up, let's learn which of these young ladies, equally pretty young ladies, is Judy Perry. Will the real Judy Perry please stand up? I <laughs> I must say, you came pretty close to fooling him right down the line. Well done. Very well done, indeed. Number two, what is your real name and what do you really do? I'm June Shuck, and I work as a personnel interviewer at Air France. Uh -oh. And number three, what is your real name and what do you do? I'm Mary Williams, and I demonstrate rival dog foods. <laughs> How do you demonstrate dog food? Well, I, I travel all over the country with a great big German Shepherd dog, and I show people how much he enjoys his food. Oh, wow. <laughs> he had me worried for just a minute. Checking the score, we find that there were three incorrect votes, and that's a proud record you actually racked up here. Three times $250 for a total of $750 to you, ladies. And thank you for joining us. She brought a great deal of beauty to our show, both in and out. Goodbye, and God bless. <laughs> I present our third team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Ted Griffin. My name is Ted Griffin. My name is Ted Griffin. Do you have additional envelopes there? Yes. Find out what's in the contents there and you'll follow along with me. I, Ted Griffin, own an aquarium in Seattle, Washington. One day last June, I heard that two commercial fishermen in Canadian waters had captured a killer whale. They immediately offered the rare and dangerous animal for sale. I rushed to the scene of the catch and for $8,000 bought the four-ton monster by now nicknamed Namu. I built a floating cage, hired a tug, and towed Namu 450 miles back to Seattle. The town went Namu nuts. His beeps were recorded and played over local radio stations. There were even reports of a song called It Ain't Gonna Rain Namu Namu. <laughs> Teenagers started a dance called the Namusi. And enterprising hucksters soon were marketing Namu toys, Namu sweatshirts, and unavoidably even Namu moo-moos. <laughs> Up to now, the whole enterprise has cost me upwards of $60,000. However, it's worth it because my aquarium now boasts the only killer whale in captivity in the world. Signed, Ted Griffin. Those three gentlemen all claim to be Ted Griffin. We'll start with Peggy Cass. Peggy? Thank you. Gee, Mr. Griffin, how could you be in for $60,000? Which number? Oh, I'm so sorry. Number two, <laughs> how could you be in for $60,000 when you're selling all those Namu Moomoos and things? Don't you get any money out of that? Well, there isn't any money yet. Oh. Well, what are they paying it for? For in paper? I mean, they must be paying for their Namu sweatshirts and their Namu Moomoos. I'd like one myself. Well, we just don't have uh, any money yet from all of that. Oh, I see. But you'll get some someday. We hope so. It, number three, is Namu the killer whale a sweet whale or a mean whale? Well, you can't say he's really either one because we don't know that much about him yet. Oh. At number one, where is he kept now? He's in a pen off the pier. Oh, number two, what color is he? Oh, well, he's black and white. Did you... Arson B. Yes, Mr. Griffin, number one. Uh, technically, a whale is just like you and me. I mean, by that, he's a mammal, right? That's he's right, a, just he like you He could come in me. here, technically, if he right wouldn't, in couldn't here, almost. say a word. You have to let him in. <laughs> well, now, what does that mean? Uh, uh, how long can he... St he's not a fish, in other words, he's right? He's not a fish. Well, how long can he stay underwater? Underwater. 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 Well, whales have been known to stay in it for an hour. Good grief. Number three, uh, is the killer whale a killer? Is he just mean uh, in, in, in natural uh, surroundings? Yes, that's his nature. How long is he, number three? How long is he? Your whale. Uh, uh, my whale is 30 feet long. All right. Number two, he really is the only one in captivity in the world? As far as we know. Can't you do anything better than go around making pins and moo-moos? I mean, I should think that we could... Send them to Russia or something. I don't know. <laughs> Kitty Carlisle. I don't know. Number three, how does a killer whale kill and what does he kill? 
Uh, well, uh, naturally he kills with his teeth. He, uh, he kills seals. Sea I lions. thought whales okay. had a strainer behind their teeth and didn't allow them to swallow very much. Uh, no, not so. Not the killer whale. Not the killer whale. Um, number two, why did they capture this whale instead of just killing him or letting him go, the, the commercial fishermen? Well, the fishermen had heard that killer whales were valuable because of the interest shown in them in the past. Thank you. Number one, can you distinguish one immediately by looking at him that he's a killer whale? What is distinguishable about him as opposed to other whales? He's black and white. And, and other whales are not? Uh, well, there's one smaller one that's black and white, but he doesn't look like a killer whale. Number three, what was the white whale in Moby Dick? What species? Tom uh, Poston. Was, I don't mean it was the species, <laughs> Tom Poston. I mean, Tom, uh, your turn. <laughs> Thank you. Number two, who is Gus Stern? I don't know. It's a very large shot in Seattle. I thought you, maybe you might know him. Number three, do you know who Lonnie Sunston is? <laughs> no, I don't. Well, she'll be probably doing the Namusi. If I know Lonnie. But number one, uh, did you go along to bring the whale back? Yes, I did. Did he, did he offer any uh, resistance when you put that pen around him? Uh, no, the, we towed the pen. The whale swam. I know, but he was in the pen, I presume. Number two, was he in the, in the pen? He was, indeed. Number two, how did they capture him in the first place? Whoever captured him. Oh, well, he, um, some nets. The fishermen were fishing with nets. He got fouled in the net. Well, there we have it. Now you get fouled in your answers. So mark them at once without change, without any consultation whatsoever. Vote now, as before, for number one, number two, or number three. All ballots are marked. Tom, for whom did you vote this time? I voted for number two. There was something plaintive and poignant in his uh, reply to the answer about, uh, the reply to the question about how much money he had made. He says, none. I thought number two had something there. Peggy Cat. Well, I voted for number one. I like the way he said, we had the pen, but the whale swam, as though <laughs> serves a killer whale right to swim 450 miles. <laughs> Orson. Well, number two looks like an enterprising young American businessman, although he has a plaintive look about him of a guy who could go 60 grand in a hole and not realize a nickel out of it. <laughs> Kitty Carlisle. I voted for number three. I think he looks like a man who has an aquarium in Seattle. <laughs> Very well, that splits it up high, wide, and handsome. So let's find out now which one of these gentlemen, in truth, is Ted Griffin. Will the real Ted Griffin please stand up? Thank you, Ted, and uh, much success to you. I do hope you have a, a sweatshirt or two for Orson before you leave. I'll try to leave one. <laughs> oh, I love it. Because I think you look great riding around in his scooter with that on. You know, the advertising you need. Now, uh, what, how much uh, do, you, do you think you realize out of this? You well, there are royalties, and uh, the sweatshirts have been selling very well. And in time, I think we'll get some fun from these various things. Nothing yet. It's uh, a long time long, deal, I guess. Long, slow process. First yeah. time for us. What does he eat? Well, much success to you. Yeah, Thank you. Eat? What does he eat? He eats salmon, and he's currently eating 500 pounds a day, and it costs oh. around 35 to 40 cents a pound. Oh, oh God. God. Well, I don't have that bill. Number one, what is your real name, and what do you do, sir? My name is Condon McDonough, and I'm with the Missile and Space Division of General Electric Company in Philadelphia. <laughs> What is your real name and what do you do? My name is Jim Preddy. I'm a country and western singer. I'm from Miami, Florida. Well, we checked the store to find that you did well. That was uh, two uh, job of twice fooling, and that's good anytime with this panel. Twice. $250 for $500 total for you to divide. And our thanks to you, gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed your visit to us as much as we did. Goodbye. God bless you. <laughs> time for tonight. A very warm good night to you, panel. Good night, Kevin. And don't you forget to join us the same time next week. Be sure to watch the daytime series of To Tell the Truth this week and see some celebrities try to stump our panel. Until then, don't you forget to tell the truth. Bye. <laughs> to Tell the Truth is a Mark Goodson, Bill Cotman production.